Hey guys, while people are still trickling in, I'm just going to go ahead and give a little introduction. Um, we're very fortunate to have Deborah Taylor Tate here. She's been an FCC commissioner since early 2006, after her nomination was un unanimously confirmed by the Senate. Among her many responsibilities at the FCC, she serves as chair of both the Universal Service Joint Board and the Federal State Joint Board on Jurisdictional Separation, as well as the Federal Chair of the Federal State Joint Conference on Advanced Telecommunications. Prior to joining the FCC, Commissioner Tate served as Chairman and Director of the Tennessee Regulatory Authority. And during her career, she's also served as a Rule 31 Mediator, an Adjunct Lecturer, the Director of Vanderbilt's Institute on Public Policy, and Legal Counsel to two Governors. Among her awards, she's been consistently recognized as one of Tennessee's most powerful people and has received the International Mary Harriman Community Leadership Award, of which Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was a previous recipient. We're very pleased to have her here today to talk about digital piracy. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. It's really great to be back here. My father actually went to the um, Army War College that is over at Carlisle Barracks. And so I used to spend a lot of time coming to shop in Philadelphia, but this is really sad to show you how long ago it was. There were still a Wanamakers. So anyway, but it's really nice to be be back. Um, uh, Pennsylvania and Tennessee share a lot in common. We kind of do similar things like we tend to elect governors like uh, Democrats for eight years and then Republicans for eight years. And we have rolling hills and horse racing and so I really feel at home. Yesterday I spoke um, at Wharton and so I'm so glad to be here and want to thank obviously Karen and Bill. And then um, is Elise Corley here? Thank you so much for organizing everything because without food, students don't show up. So <laughs> thank you all. Um, and obviously, I don't know how many of you all know Professor Yu, but he has been a very dear friend of mine for a long time, helped me when I was at the state commission level, and really has been a visionary in a lot of these digital, digital topics because he's very familiar, for instance, with the old telephone infrastructure and all the laws and regulations that have to do with intercarrier compensation and all kinds of boring regimes from the past you all don't want to learn about. But he also really was one of the first people who had a true vision about what convergence was going to do for America and really the need, and unfortunately um, uh, it has not happened, but the need for regulations and regulators to catch up with where technology is. So I'm so glad that, that um, that I've had an opportunity to work with him and have continued to work with him after I got to the um, FCC. And so I was really glad to come here. A lot of people wonder why an FCC commissioner wants to talk about intellectual property. Professor, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for welcoming me. I was raving about you, did you hear? And now it will be on tape. You can watch it over and over and over when you have a bad day. Anyway, it's great to see you. Thank you. <clears throat> anyway, so lots of people probably question why an FCC professor, uh, commissioner would be here to talk about issues like intellectual property, but one of the reasons is because it's very professional, very, very personal to me, not just about a professional um, part of my job, but because as you all can imagine, my next door neighbors, the Nashville economy, the Tennessee economy, um, video producers, we're the third largest video producer um, in the entire nation. And so obviously all of this creation of content is exponentially growing. Um, and unfortunately, global music piracy alone causes $12.5 billion of economic losses every year and a loss of over $2.7 billion in individual workers' earnings. And get this, $131 million in lost corporate income and taxes. So as you all can see, this has an incredible impact on our entire economy and even more so in this downturn that we're in right now, which I, now is a recession. Um, the U.S. economy lost $58 billion in output that could have been realized if piracy had not occurred. And we lost over 375,000 jobs due to piracy, federal and state governments 
lose $2.6 billion annually through unrealized tax revenue. The U.S. Chamber estimates that counterfeiting and piracy cost the U.S. up to $250 billion. So you begin to start to see um, how much this affects all of us. And it's not just my friends in the music and content business. It's also the auto industry, billions of dollars lost in parts counterfeiting, the fashion industry, I saw somebody walk in with a Cole Haan bag, uh, about $12 billion annually, and the software industry, which lost $48 billion just last year. Um, obviously, modern medicines uh, that take years to produce, um, and intellectual capital all being lost. The U.S.-based Center for Medicines predicts that counterfeit drug sales will reach reach $75 billion globally in 2010, an increase of more than 90% in just the past five years. And obviously then the, the pocketbook of the average American also takes a hit, particularly in job losses and what that causes to our overall welfare system. Like many issues today, obviously, this isn't just happening in America. But this is another reason that this is so great that you all are beginning to talk about this at this point in your careers, because this is really going to become and already has become a global issue. Obviously, um, I'll never forget the first time that I was in Beijing. The streets were absolutely lined with tables of obviously illegal CDs and DVDs. Um, I'm not keeping up with my uh, with my slides. Sorry. Um, and one of the things that I try to do whenever I'm uh, around the world visiting with our colleagues, with our ministers, is to take the exact number of illegal downloads that are going on in their countries. And actually, I always take legal CDs with me and hand them out at dinner as a gift and say, you know, please try to help us do something about this. Um, sometimes I think that they don't realize how much this is impacting all of their industries, not just the American music industry industry. And in fact, when I was in Brazil, um, in Sao Paulo, the AmCham, which is the American Chamber, as you all know, we have American businesses all over the world and there are American Chambers also throughout the world. They actually hosted a specific program to educate and make all the CEOs um, more aware of piracy on all types of goods and software research and software applications far beyond the music industry. Obviously, the opportunity to share content have proliferated over the last 10 years. When Napster first appeared, most pirated material was music, obviously, with a, the beginning of a few videos and software. But no longer is the problem focused just on one type of media, but really is across all digital media, video, music, software, or any other type which can be stolen on the internet. However, as piracy has grown, and this is one of the things that I really try to encourage as a pro-market based solution regulator and that is rather than government regulations that we try to look to the industry for solutions and so the solutions have also been growing in the industry content owners now know that technology is also the vital weapon that they can use to combat and curb piracy Bob Iger, as you all may know, is the CEO in, of Disney. And I went to see him and he said, Commissioner Tate, you know, our number one issue that we're facing as Disney is piracy. The, and he says the best way to combat piracy is to bring content to market on a well-timed, well-priced <coughs> basis. Last year, I had the opportunity to go out there and visit with um, Albert Chang, who is the executive vice president. You all may read about him in articles for digital media, and his colleagues told me how Disney uses technology to make its content available to consumers. How many of you all have been going on like ABC and watching ABC and shows online? Do most people do that? And so do you all enjoy that just as much as television? Do you all even watch TV anymore? Most everybody watches IP. 
That's, that's fabulous. And that's exactly what they, you know, intended to do when they launched this ad-supported video player. They weren't really sure whether it would end up cannibalizing television or not. What's really interesting is one of the shows I saw some statistic on um, for advertisers. I was giving an ad speech last week in Chicago, and the shows that are online, their demographic seems to skew to like 28-year-olds, while the same exact show skews to like 42 year olds on television. So it's also very interesting for advertisers who want to advertise to a specific demographic or age group. Anyway, obviously now with iTunes where you're able to purchase TV episodes and on many other websites where the content can be streamed or downloaded legitimately. Um, I also had the chance to see how important DMR uh, methods are used to enable new technology of, of electronic distribution. You know, some are uh, obviously complex but also very um, effective. Two widely used innovations that are helping to combat the wave of illegal content online. Obviously and I bet you all have studied these, are digital watermarking and digital fingerprinting, but I wanted to talk about them just for a moment. Obviously, <coughs> with the digital watermarking, the data is directly into the content as it appears on the internet or passes through a network, sometimes a university network. The content can be scanned for the digital watermark. Owners of the content can actually review the listings then on a P2P server or scan uploaded videos on websites and then uh, examine the content for the watermark. In South Korea, Warner Bro Brothers is adding piracy of its DVDs by releasing watermarked versions online instead of the DRM protected DVDs. The particular watermark in these videos is called a forensic watermark and will allow Warner Brothers to track its content through networks as it is illegally shared. While this technique is effective, as always technology and creative minds of course create alternative ways to then defeat these techniques when they come online. Common methods include encrypting the file or actually trying to strip the watermark from the content. While both methods may hide the pirated material among numerous files on the internet for a short period, other methods, including digital fingerprinting, will ultimately find the material. And so digital fingerprinting is another new innovative way to detect illegal content. With fingerprinting, characteristics of the video are cataloged with the ability to capture both the audio and video samples. These samples may include the particular way that the color shifts in a scene or the background music that is played behind a video. These are then stored on a database and actually compared with the real legal version. These fingerprint files are highly compact and are stored on inexpensive servers. For example, leading digital fingerprinting company, um, Audible Magic, expects a turnkey system to cost about $100,000 for a large university this year. And unlike watermarking, where changing the content can defeat the watermark, the digital fingerprinting um, has the ability to actually identify the eliminated all altered materials. This allows detection of copyrighted material even if the user tries to defeat it by rotating the image or changing the color values. Audible Magic counts Google, Microsoft, YouTube, and MySpace among its clients, so be careful. Its sophisticated software sniffs out illegal content and is having a very positive effect on the war against piracy. In one example, Audible Magic software created an 80% reduction in traffic on a college campus. Um, once the illegal content was removed. One, this just helps with congestion on all of your networks here. This shows how the cooperation of both industry players and ISPs have stemmed the growth of piracy, while very minimal types of regulation was needed. Companies desire to minimize their liability when it comes to pirated material and openly accept these technologies if they will help them to remain competitive while also blocking the illegal content. 
NBC obviously realized the importance of the internet to their business, just like ABC and Disney, and understood that they needed to protect their content online as well, and did so through the new fingerprinting technology with great success. And so, as this slide shows, and I was shocked about this, that less than 1% of the Olympic coverage viewed this past summer was pirated. This wasn't due, obviously, to the lack of viewers with 10 million hours of coverage on NBC's websites, but the employment of fingerprinting technology identified the pirated material and allowed them to remove it from P2P and video sites. This aggressive strategy helped eliminate this material while obviously allowing NBC's legitimate viewer base to watch the Olympics. Um, these are through legal channels and have created a framework that coordinates with other content creators that respects copyright and yet creates rules that they all can live by. In much the same way universities wish to minimize their risk, the risk of their students and the potential for increased tuition paid by parents um, for the expansion of storage capabilities and ultimately then to stem the flow of illegal information and piracy. So obviously it requires cooperation in order to um, stop piracy. This applies not only to websites but also to universities. Um, in 2004, a study found 58% of students at two of the largest universities engaged in file sharing. 40% of their music collection consisted of pirated illegal music downloads. College students are also more likely to engage in piracy than the general population, 25% versus 16%. With piracy becoming so prevalent on college campuses and with such a high amount of traffic dedicated to P2P sites, much of which is illegal, universities must begin to manage their networks to ensure that those who really need the bandwidth for legitimate tasks such as research, emailing to your professors, getting your research done yourselves. Um, some campuses have taken measures to create their own tools to combat piracy. The University of Florida is an example. Once they realized the absolute huge cost to their budget that piracy was creating, they de developed their own tool called Red Lambda that helped bring the university's number of infringe infringement claims down to near zero. And the infrastructure and bandwidth savings were so great that the university was awarded a taxpayer award for all the savings that were generated. Additionally, other universities, Vanderbilt, University of Virginia, provide university-wide downloading on an annual basis at an inexpensive price. So I want to also applaud Penn for their implementation of an acceptable use policy, clearly setting boundaries regarding illegal and legal use of the electronic resources. And what is your system called that you all have here? that you all can download? <clears throat> Ruckus program. Ruckus? Yeah. And it's free? It's free. And then do you all get to keep it when you leave? No. Okay. Okay. For the whole time you're here though? And you don't pay for it annually? Well, not, not on top of your, you know, tuition and fees kind of thing, so. Okay. So, <coughs> These are really examples of, um, here were some of the statistics. Um, these are examples that illustrate the positive side of network management, something that you all will hear a lot more about in the coming months. We have already had hearings from one part of the country to the other on um, network management, but it really can play a positive role when it comes to eliminating online piracy um, and restricting unlawful uses of the internet. The um, commission, as you all know, has four principles about the legal uses of internet and legally connecting to any um, information that you all want. Um, and so it's crucial though that we also allow operators to manage their networks and not tie their hands with too overly prescriptive regulations. 
Um, so one of the topics that you all will be hearing that Congress will be debating over the next year is something that um, has been around for a while called net neutrality. And so that is all part of the network management discussion. Um, unfortunately, that if it's implemented in its strictest forms, it could tie the hands of many network operators from being able to cut down on piracy and other dangers as well that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Digital fingerprinting and watermarking would not be possible if net neutrality is enforced in its harshest form. Um, of all the great advantages that the internet has brought to all of us, all of your education almost, all of your research um, re really is available through the internet. I, do you all go to the library anymore and research? Does anybody pull books off the shelf anymore? I mean, it is just amazing what has just happened in the last 15 years with regarding to um, research. I try to refer to myself a lot as a humble regulator. As I said, I really try to encourage marketplace solutions whenever possible. And so this really is part of knowing when to take regulatory action and when not to step in and take it. And so as technology is changing, I think that one of our roles needs to be seeing how the industries actually come forward and try to solve some of these problem, problems themselves. Um, one of the problems with net neutrality being enforced in a very strict way is that carriers may not be able to distinguish between any packets or be able to prioritize very time sensitive traffic such as video and voice traffic now that most everyone is moving to VOIP for their phone uh, telecommunications. We will have lost much of the innovation actually that the internet made possible. We should let the market work as much as possible and let operators manage their networks in order to make them work faster and better for all of us and find solutions rather than binding their hands with prescriptive regulation so that when a problem does arise, a market solution rather than governmental intervention should be the first step. And this is exactly what happened if you all followed any of our hearings about Comcast and BitTorrent this past summer. I know because Comcast headquarters is here you all probably had a lot of it in your local news, um, which led up to a Comcast order by the FCC. The two parties came to a solution on how to manage Comcast network without harming the BitTorrent users, and I think that both of them were better off for it. I met with Comcast today, um, and they have actually implemented, by the end of the year, will implement in all of their markets a protocol agnostic way of um, dealing dealing with P2P users. While we should not regulate um, how traffic does flow across the internet, it's imperative that we begin educating at a much younger age um, all of the issues and problems and impact, negative impact that piracy has on our country. I think that if students learned at a much earlier age to respect the intellectual property rights as we do with regular property rights, that those who uh, create content and if they could learn the real legal consequences of their action and receive education regarding the legal alternatives to accessing content, especially a respect for, as I said, property rights, then hopefully we will have a better educated generation regarding intellectual property. So how do we make sure that our children understand and refrain from stealing this intellectual property? I think that in this case, government industry can work together, and while we have not reached a critical mass, obviously progress is being made. The RIAA, along with the American Council on Education, uh, under the name EDUCAUSE, have worked together to make anti-piracy educational materials available to universities and to high schools to help defray infringing activity. Curriculum for children has been made for nearly every grade beginning at kindergarten, and I'm glad that these groups have taken the initiative to create content and have done so a great job at introducing some of the um, uh, concepts to, uh, that piracy 
uh, to, ver to kids at very young ages. This, for example, is um, a new entire series called Faux Pas and Dangerous, Dangerous Downloads that an entity called I Keep Safe has created. And in fact, they have translated it into numerous languages. When I was in China, I took a copy that had been translated into Chinese to the minister there. Um, but it's just one other example of marketplace solutions um, to ensure that these tools are being put in place at a very, very young age. Um, in another way, the government has acted by incorporating piracy education into the Higher Education Opportunity Act. This bill requ requires colleges to teach both students and employees about the dangers of illegal downloading and the personal liability, obviously, associated with distributing copyrighted materials and ensures that colleges assist students in accessing valuable digital information through legal rather than illegal channels. So this bill takes a reasoned, calculated step toward eliminating piracy materials by students in a least restrictive way. And this is a meaningful step to try to work at the college level, but I think, as I said earlier, that we really need to start much earlier. Piracy is too often viewed as just a victimless crime and something that everybody does. And so that's why it's really crucial that we begin to truly instill this respect for creativity, for content production um, at a much, much earlier level. Um, you know, your generation has basically grown up on computers and uh, on the internet. My kids did as well. And I think that at an early age, you all were going out and getting music and not even thinking about whether or not um, it was copyrighted, for instance. But at this point in time, now that almost everything in life, almost all of our valuable property has moved online, it um, becomes more and more important for us to introduce, th introduce this at an earlier age. And in addition to try to get especially younger kids to realize the impact that it really does have on our economy and on individuals, um, creative talents, brilliant entrepreneurs, and even our medical researchers. <clears throat> Some of you all, did anybody go to public school growing up? I don't know how many of you all know, but most of your public schools were um, connected to the internet by a program that the FCC oversees called the E-Rate program. And in fact, I was very excited because Tennessee is rarely at the top of anything, but we were first in uh, connecting all of our schools to the internet, which was really, really an incredible uh, uh, benefit, obviously, to thousands and thousands of students. The E-Rate program spends over $2 billion to connect schools and libraries every year to the internet all across the country. Every single state receives this money. And then in addition to this, many states obviously also expend taxpayer monies to connect schools. So I think that this is another opportunity to help further digital and media literacy at a much younger and younger age so that not only are we teaching kids at young, even at the kindergarten level, how to get on and how to research and how to use the internet, but we're also teaching them about legal and illegal uses. And so I hope that the FCC is going to learn some lessons from the Higher Education Act that I just mentioned, and that we will start incorporating some of those regulations. If you're going to get billions of dollars in federal funding, then you also ought to make sure that you're teaching children about the importance of um, only using utilizing the computer and the internet for legal legal uses. Um, uh, certainly we can require tools that prevent children from going to illegal websites, inappropriate ones, adult websites, or even child pornographic websites, which by the way, you all probably didn't know this, but it's phenomenal. Uh, child pornography websites make up 12% of all the websites. Um, similarly, the way that we predicate the use of highway funds, for instance, upon the states abiding by certain goals, such as, as you remember, seat belts became required and DUI checkpoints. So many federal programs come with strings attached, and so this is something that I hope that the FCC will do in the future um, with the E-rate funds. Um, and so as you all 
you know, move forward. I'm so glad that you all are beginning to, um, you know, look at some of these issues because I think that they are significant to our economy, as I said, and not just locally, but also much more so globally. The private sector is continuing to develop these incredible, incredible tools to combat illegal material on their networks, and then government must continue to provide leadership and education regarding the negative impact the real world impact upon our creative talents from pharmaceuticals, as I said, to uh, medical research, to motion pictures, um, and to help bring all the parties to the table to try to um, discuss when these occur. Ireland, I don't know if you all you know, have studied, but obviously was once home to an entire uh, generation of some of the greatest literary works in history. And they saw that they were beginning to lose all of their writers to America and to many other countries um, because of high taxes and because of other um, issues that were going on in Ireland, which resulted in a huge and very negative impact to their economy. And um, in addition to just the loss of this whole uh, generation of literary talents. And so the government at the very top started creating a plan to try to encourage them to return to Ireland, return to their homeland from tax incentives to the expansion of broadband out to many areas so that writers could live out in the countryside and continue to write. So this is the type of leadership that we could um, emulate in the United States so that we try to protect the truly great minds and the creative talents from our, storyteller, from our storytellers to researchers, from uh, the blues to country to hip hop to software and applications development all across our country. So I really want to encourage you all, before I leave, I wanted to tell you a couple of things because my kids are your age, and that is that um, this has been one of the most incredible opportunities. I never thought that sitting in a room almost exactly like this, um, taking entertainment uh, and intellectual property law, that one day I would be at the FCC. And so sometimes when you look at people's bios, you think, oh yeah, there was this straight line to the FCC, but there were really a lot of twists and turns along the way, and I hope you all will, when you fi find something that really lights up your passions, I hope that you'll take the opportunity to go out and do that. The other thing is that with the new uh, president who is in town. I've been seeing the helicopters flying all over town all day. Um, what a great opportunity to get involved and maybe spend some time in public service um, or working for a nonprofit. So I hope that you all may find time in your legal careers at some point uh, to step out of just being an attorney or just being a corporate attorney uh, or a litigator and actually get out and give back to your your communities. Um, find a balance in your life. I know it's really hard and right now you all are trying to get prepared for exams and I know it's a really stressful time in your life, but try to find balance. Try to invest in as much in your personal life and your health and people that you care about as you do in your career because you're going to need them all along the way. So anyway, thank you all for having me. I'm so glad you all are interested in this topic. Obviously you can tell that I'm very concerned about it. Big of Big and Rich lives two doors down from me and so most everybody that I interact with at the grocery store has some uh, involvement in the music industry and so I've seen its effect on our city and our state in a very negative and very real way. So I hope that you all will continue to be part of this conversation about what to do going forward and of course always download legally. So thank you all so much. And I'm happy to take a couple of questions. It doesn't have to be about this if there are other topics. I'm sorry that I didn't have my slideshow that I showed at Wharton yesterday because it's got Janet Jackson and the wardrobe malfunction and all kinds of other fun things. When Karen was reading out my um, bio, it sounds like I head up all these boring things like intercarrier <laughs> compensation and universal service, but it really does. Uh, it really is a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic job. And I guess the one question that people ask 
asked me is, what what did you least expect? And I didn't realize how much the FCC really, how much time we spend negotiating and working with um, ministers and other uh, administrative agencies, independent agencies like the FCC all over the world. And so that's been a, a really fabulous thing to watch the world get smaller and smaller and really because of the access to broadband and the internet.